the biggest buyers of consumer electronics in Europe. Each year, we spend over two and a half billion pounds on TVs, videos, CD players, and music centers. Of the 50 or so million units that are bought annually in Europe, the British public takes one quarter of them. But although we are enthusiastic about buying these commodities, British-owned companies play no significant part in their manufacture. We've really lost touch with the technology that's driving forward consumer electronics. At one time, we were quite advanced in terms of television technology, receiver technology, and so on. Now all of the significant innovations are being undertaken elsewhere. The research is being done elsewhere. And we are seeing these kinds of things built into our products, but British firms are no longer, or even the subsidiaries of Japanese firms, are no longer in the forefront of these trends. The British consumer electronics industry is small. It's predominantly not British. It's predominantly governed from elsewhere, principally Japan. But it nevertheless is in some respects quite important as a lead market, particularly for Europe. We've become used to the fact that most of the electronic goods on sale in British stores are designed and developed abroad. However, companies like Japan's Panasonic, as well as having a substantial manufacturing presence within the UK, are also beginning to research and develop here. What are the new products that are arriving now? We are looking at uh, high definition television, uh, which means, of course, 16 by 9 aspect ratio. Um, we're looking at digital uh, tape formats. Uh, and also areas of digitalization such as CD Interactive. We've been talking about digital audio tape, or DAT, for some time now, and uh, we think that probably this will now be uh, confined to the professional market, studio use professional recordings. What we are looking at for the introduction fairly shortly is so-called DCC, which is Digital Compact Cassette, and this is a, a product which provides uh, compatibility with existing analog cassettes, you know, the normal tapes that you use in your uh, personal stereos and your current hi-fi systems. And uh, the new machines will be able to play back all those old uh, or existing analog tape libraries, but you will be able to record uh, digitally so that uh, you get the benefit of higher quality sound uh, comparable to that of compact disc. It's a cutthroat industry, there's no doubt about it. Unlike, for example, telecommunications or big computers where major customers are organizations or public sector customers, it's you and me, it's the people who buy the goods in the electronic shops who determine the fate of the firm. So they have to be sensitive to consumer demand. Now, that doesn't mean that they can't be innovative, as we know, because firms can lead customers into products that they didn't imagine were there. I mean, who knew about the video recorder apart from a few professionals in the 1960s and early 70s? And yet here we are, 20 years later, almost all of us have one at home. So new markets can be created, but only where those products meet consumer needs and people are willing to pay for them. So it's a cutthroat industry, and one which is driven by the demands of a global market. Nonetheless, there are a number of large manufacturers within it who have been innovative, and have influenced demand? Certainly the big multinational players are firms like Matsushita, Philips, Toshiba, Hitachi and so on. Less large but very significant is a firm like Sony. I say a firm like Sony but actually there's no firm like Sony. Sony is unique. Sony is always at the forefront of um, technological development. Now Sony was the first company to invest overseas. It built a TV plant in California, the first Japanese company to do so. It was the first Japanese company to build a plant in Wales. It was the first Japanese company to make a big investment in software. And I think we see Sony as a leader. And the big players like um, Matsushita and Hitachi and Toshiba following, not very far behind, but following nevertheless. Well, Sony and Matsushita are, are two very special companies within the, the Japanese hardware manufacturing spectrum. Mashusta has Panasonic, Techniques, Quasar, and a majority ownership in JVC. JVC is a, is a company that licensed the VHS technology from Ampex and had the exclusive rights to the VHS technology throughout the world. Sony created the beta format and the 8mm format that you see today. Uh, Sony has been involved in DAT, digital audio tape. Uh, we have Laserdisc, we have, I'm told, new technologies that the public will find sometime in the near future where movies can be stored on devices that are much smaller than Laserdiscs and obviously much smaller than videotape. 
with incredible clarity. Um, those two companies are innovators. And because they either created or introduced new technologies into the marketplace, they have a vested interest in making sure that product is available to be shown or heard on their technology. There's a small group of consumers always on the edge of technology, always trying to buy the next greatest thing. That's a very small, um, a very small group. Uh, the industry of culture deals with masses, uh, and what drives that is really uh, the software. Uh, you can see that in cable TV and in satellite TV and in VCR penetration. If you look across any type of delivery system or any type of technology, when it becomes uh, when it becomes financial or financially rewarding, is when you have the programming, the software, which is the programming that drives consumers that want to get that hardware. Clearly, the hardware, the TVs, the videos, the music centers, can only succeed if there is software, films, music, which is available to be played on them. This link between the hardware products and the software has some benefits for Britain. Well, I think if one defines consumer electronics broadly to include hardware and software, then I think that we can see that there is a very significant contribution that British industry can make to the future of consumer electronics. We have had for a long time one of the, what is recognized to be one of the best television systems in the world, that is in terms of programming, and it seems to me that once one takes into account the importance of software archives, for example, and particularly the uh, skills and so on which exist here in the television industry, then it's quite possible that given good leadership, finance, investment and the rest of it, but that uh, British industry could play some part in the future of, of consumer electronics. For the moment, the hardware industry is dominated by the Japanese giants, and software production is vigorous in the West. Hollywood is still an important centre for film and television production, and the music industry is strong on both sides of the Atlantic. However, in recent years, the two sides of the industry have been coming closer together. There's been a growing relationship between software and hardware manufacturer, it's that relationship that we're going to focus on in this program. I think all the big manufacturers have learned from the lessons of the 1970s, where really the new technology all hit us for the first time, that you can't just find a product and suddenly put it into a format and it's going to be successful. Um, the, the things that lead to product success are cheapness, availability in the marketplace, um, the fact that, again, the software is available, which is only one part of the picture. The principle view of it is if you're an innovator, someone who creates product and you're trying to protect an invention, buying into the software that you play on your hardware is a form of insurance. If you remember, there was a time when Sony had something called Betamax and it was competing with something called VHS. And at that point in time, they were very competitive formats. Sony controlled their hardware very, very specifically. I think that uh, JVC, which introduced the VHS format into the world and controls that format, uh, got to a lot more manufacturers than did Sony. And the ultimate reality is there ain't no more Betamax. And VHS is the current video standard. So I think that's a lesson that a lot of people learned, perhaps some the hard way. It was a bloody good format, Betamax, very high quality. Hence, people like the BBC are using it now. Um, or they're using Betacam, which is basically the same thing. Um, it was a well-developed um, technology. The problem with it was, was that Sony didn't license the manufacture of it to anybody else, and they couldn't find the software to put on it very quickly. I think if we look back at the uh, video format wars of the, uh, the early 80s, um, it is quite evident that the, the result really came about because of the involvement of software uh, in uh, uh, terms of rental of tapes and the availability of rental of ta uh, tape rental on say the VHS format was much more readily available than should I say the other formats and, and so this means that for future technology as it's developed it's very important that there's a symbiosis between the software and hardware side. It is not purely for the ben benefit of the hardware industry. Clearly if the software and hardware industries can work together the, the software side can benefit from the new technology that the hardware is developing and of course the hardware side can develop or benefit by having at launch uh, a complete catalogue of software to use on this new product. All of the companies have had bad experiences with 
incompatible standards in consumer electronics, whether it's videos or um, tape cartridges or whatever. And now there's a great determination to try to avoid that kind of standards battle by agreeing to cooperate in advance of market launch. It doesn't always work, but most companies are attempting to do that at the moment. The format wars of the 80s meant that hardware companies started to do deals with software companies in order to ensure that there would be films and music available in their standard. But the hardware companies have also done more to agree the standards for new formats amongst themselves. I think if one looks at the newer generation of uh, products and technologies, for example now VHS is the standard video format more or less across the world and therefore one can uh, use the same kinds of machines with a little bit of alteration across the world. If one looks at even newer technologies, compact disc is one where you can use exactly the same technology across the world. That means that firms can build machines which are standardized for world markets and then they can redesign cosmetically to suit different consumer tastes. It certainly isn't the case that there's a homogenous world market, but there are certain characteristics in the technology which make it possible to plan for a global strategy in, in new product development. The software industry poses certain problems because it is much more partitioned by different kinds of taste and language and culture than is the hardware industry. People all over the world would be quite happy with the same CD player. They won't be happy with the same disc, the same music. They would be happy with the same video recorder, but they won't be happy with the same tape on it. And it's a much more complicated uh, market to be in, I think, than the hardware market. But it's one which is absolutely crucial for the future of those firms, and that's why they're in it. The Japanese have recognized that there is one consumer product very marketable that they can't reproduce. They haven't managed to reproduce the American movie, haven't managed to reproduce the American song. They're coming here, they're buying into the industry because that's the only way they can control a flow of the product that they sell in their own marketplace and that they hope to be able to market around the world. Because of this, some of the big hardware manufacturers decided that rather than establish agreements with software producers, they should buy them outright. Early in 1988, Sony bought CBS Records, but Hollywood was surprised in 1989 when Sony bought out Columbia Pictures. A year later, the Japanese giant, Machusta, followed the trend with the purchase of the MCA Universal Studios. Machusta, which purchased MCA Universal, is a tremendously uh, aggressive manufacturer of television sets around the world. Machusta owns uh, many, many systems that are dependent on high-definition television. They have a major investment in high def. There are roughly 800 million television sets in the world today those 800 million television sets will be replaced over the next decade by sets that are compatible with high-definition broadcast. Matt Schuster will have an enormously significant piece of that turnover. I would guess that in very round numbers, that will be worth a trillion dollars to Matt Schuster, this decade of conversion. So the logical extension of that manufacturing and retail conversion is the creation of software in high def and the familiarization, both in television and motion pictures, on a worldwide basis with high definition as a viable form, I think you'll see in the next two or three years an enormous amount of product coming out of Hollywood in high definition, something that no one was taking seriously two years ago. The industry of culture is, I believe, mass culture, particularly uh, mass Western culture, um, in which the, uh, uh, in a marketing piece of jargon, the decision-making units, the, the people that actually make decisions on purchasing things, have a certain set of um, uh, uh, requirements of what they purchase. Um, and so within that industry of culture, people who buy uh, Laserdisc or DATs are also the same people uh, and buying for the same needs that, that go to your movies and buy your uh, music and buy your tapes and watch your TV programs. So that the, on the marketing side of this has gotten very sophisticated. Um, in that if you go to the major studios and look at the, the marketing analysis they do, it's not terribly dissimilar to consumer electronics companies, to apparel companies, uh, etc., that market into the, into the uh, same field of play. Um, and I think that uh, certain companies that have a broader long-term strategic view 
see the uh, see the benefit of that. They see that they are selling into the same market, and whether that market is for people to go to theme parks, or people to listen to music, or people to buy their consumer uh, electronics, they're basically marketing into the same area. And I think that some some companies that have a longer term strategic view ha have seen that. And I believe that Japanese, the leading Japanese consumer companies, are at the forefront of that movement. We can see why the Japanese companies had a vested interest in Hollywood. But did it make sound business sense to buy the studios rather than extend the usual deals? That has been the traditional way. Unfortunately, that leaves them at the mercy of negotiators. That means every picture that comes out, they have to renegotiate. How much will we pay for the video rights, for the cable rights, for the TV rights? This way, they cut out that middleman. The product belongs to them. They don't have to pay for it each time, and they don't have to pay a new price each time. One of the things that differentiates American companies from Japanese companies is the way we value our companies. American companies in the entertainment business today have values of somewhere between 10 and 20 times earnings. Japanese companies tend to have astronomical price earnings ratio where a company is worth maybe 70 or more times the earnings of the company. Um, American companies are used to having profit levels of 10 to 15 percent, pretty typically maybe higher in good years and obviously much worse in, in bad years. Japanese companies have been content to have profit margins on the order of magnitude of 3 to 5 percent. So when Mashusta purchased MCA, they were actually purchasing company with a much higher percentage of profitability for the dollars spent than their own asset base. And because of that, Mashusta's acquisition of MCA actually increased the earnings and the earning potential of Mashusta proper. And since the Mashusta company is based on a very high price earnings ratio, they picked up a new value for Mashusta that was many times higher than the cost of acquiring MCA. So they really made out, made out like a bandit. It was a very, very shrewd move on their part. One of the smart, smartest things about MCA and Lou Wasserman's sort of triumph in building that company was to, to design an entertainment company that would have reliable, steady cash flow no matter what aspect of the industry was doing well. And uh, from Matt Schuster's point of view, I'm sure it's very reassuring, having spent a lot of money, to know that there's a company that will do well even if one division or the other isn't doing particularly well at that moment. We hear what was in it for Japanese investors, but what about Hollywood? What was in it for the entertainment community? Well, I'd say this. Uh, as an independent in Hollywood, you're used to offshore sources of finance. The Japanese are here now, and that's wonderful and very helpful to us. Uh, there have been Arabs here. There have been Europeans here of all kinds. There have been, uh, during the oil boom in the late 60s, the uh, many citizens of Mexico were heavily involved in financing the motion picture industry. We recognize that there will be an ebb and flow in offshore finance, and we're simply prepared to deal with whatever shows up. Um, the Japanese, because of their longer-term manufacturing needs, however, probably will have much greater impact than anyone's had on Hollywood um, since its founding. Even if it is a good investment, many observers ask whether the ethos of Japanese business and the temperament of Hollywood makes for an easy partnership. Do the Japanese fully understand what they've got into? So far, they don't fit into the culture of Hollywood at all. Their money is here. Their presence is not very strongly felt. Whether that will continue into the future, no one knows. There's a lot of almost paranoia here about what influence the Japanese are going to try and have upon these cultural expressions. So far, they insist that they will have no effect whatsoever, that they see uh, a program that works, a system that works, and they want it to keep working in the same way. They really have to trust the Americans to run this business. In one sense, you know, absent maybe a century more of, of, of cultural osmosis, they are unlikely to be able to make creative decisions that have any meaningful impact on profitability at all. They really have to trust the people who make the movies. And from that perspective, it may be a very, very happy marriage. This is totally a talent-driven business. You can have all the hardware you want, you can have all the studio power you want, you can have all the financing and distribution you want. But if you don't find the talent, if you don't find the movie, or the television show, or the song that, that reaches and affects an audience, you have absolutely nothing. All the technology in the world won't buy you that. And another thing that makes this business really a horrible business 
is that it's very, very capital intensive. We eat up money like crazy. The average movie budget today is close to $27 million, $28 million. The average cost of opening a movie theatrically in the United States and Canada on a wide basis is now $12 million. That's just to open the movie. That doesn't sustain the release. So that you're talking about rec recouping just to break even on an average basis somewhere in the 40 to $50 million range when you throw in interest and overhead. And that's a tremendous amount of revenue that has to be generated on an idea and a spark. And what other business do you know where if it doesn't work, you can't put it on sale? What do you, you ever been to a movie theater where, hey, today we have a movie, it's not quite as good as the ones you're used to seeing, so you don't have to pay $7, you can see it for three. That doesn't seem to happen. And also, when you learn about what made your movie successful, how do you apply it to another movie? How do you translate those skills that you've acquired in marketing this one movie and apply it somewhere else? So every time we make a movie, every time we create a television program or, or a, a, a sound score, we have to relearn the business every single time. And how many businesses do you know where you have to manufacture the entire product line before you know whether or not you have any buyers? I think they're going to have difficulties, and a firm which has perfected its business strategy on the basis of highly efficient manufacturing and being highly attuned to the consumer demands in the marketplace for hardware in particular are going to have difficulty when there's a different kind of consumer market with respect to movies, a different kind of industry, people by different kinds of people. And there certainly is and will be a clash of corporate cultures. Now I wouldn't want to say that they will not make a success of that, but I think these companies have a great deal of learning to do in managing software houses, film studios and so on. But I think our experience of what those companies have learnt in the past about manufacturing should make us cautious to say that they can't learn it all again with respect to film and television production. We've seen that the ownership of the industry of culture, like many other industries, is becoming more global, and that Japan and the United States are emerging as the key players. But is there a place for Britain in this industry? Britain fits in as a very efficient manufacturer now of consumer electronics products. The firms are largely Japanese, but the industry is healthy. We're exporting hardware products. We have an enormous amount of potential in the culture industries in Britain, not so much in movies, but in television. And we have enormous uh, skills, we have big archives, we have, in a sense, the kind of ingredients that this fusion between hardware and software will need to deploy in the future. What we're waiting for, I think, is companies with the drive and the vision to exploit that. The Japanese majors have, um, are occupying themselves in the United States. They don't yet have time to really consider the, the potential of the UK market, but it, I think this is only a matter of time. <laughs>